Okay. Um, right, so I'm going to talk to you about the topic of my PhD, which is syntactic transfer in the bilingual brain. Um, so essentially, what that means, or what I'm asking, is whether or not aspects of one language um, influence um, aspects of the other language. So essentially, if I'm speaking and if I'm reading in English, am I also activating the inactive language? So am I activating the grammatical rules of Welsh, even though there's no need to? Okay, so the reason I decided to focus on syntax um, is because in the literature there's been an extensive amount of work looking at coactivation of language in general. Um, but the majority of this work is focused on semantic coactivation and on lexical coactivation. And less work was done on um, syntactic coactivation. Right, so I have three main research questions. Um, so, first of all, does syntax transfer between languages? Um, so in order to ask, answer this question, I'm going to draw upon some results from an ERP study that we've done. Um, second of all, how does syntax transfer between languages? So if this transfer occurs, what are the underlying mechanisms that drive the transfer? And again, I'm going to discuss some ERP data here. And then finally, to what extent does syntactic transfer occur? And here I'm going to talk about some preliminary data from an eye tracking study. Okay, so does syntax transfer between languages? In order to answer this question, we decided to utilize a syntactic rule that's idiosyncratic to Welsh and apply it to English sentences. Um, and that rule is the rule of soft mutation. So soft mutation is a morphosyntactic process that alters the initial consonants of words when they're placed in specific contexts, like syntactic contexts. So for example, the word cabech, which is tent in Welsh, would mutate to babech, ka, which is cat, would mutate to ga, and teledi, which is television, would mutate to daledi. But these mutations don't just occur randomly, they have to be in specific contexts. So for example, um, feminine nouns, such as princess or toasogas, would mutate after the definite article the. So toasogas would be, become er doasogas, so you have the t to d change there. And if we applied these rules to English words or to English sentences, then they would create the non-word princess. So princess would change to the princess. Okay, so that's essentially what we did. Um, so we manipulated English sentences and the sentence final word so that they either adhered to the mutation rules. So you see brins here, so that's a legal mutation with a P to B change. Or they did not. So we have grins, which is an aberrant word. So you would never have a P to G mutation in Welsh. And what we're interested in is the difference between these two. So is brins more expected than grins because of the mutation rules in Welsh? Okay, so um, as I said, this is an ERP study. So we presented the first clause of the sentence in one go. Um, so this was self-paced, and then the rest of the sentence present was presented one word at a time, and ERPs were measured um, time-locked to the onset of the target word. Right, so you might say, well, any difference that you find between brins and grins is simply just a familiarity effect because our participants are more used to seeing these mutated words. So in order to kind of control for that, we added a factor of context. So half of our sentences were these no mutation context sentences. So if you translated these into Welsh, they would not end in a mutation. And then the other half were mutation context sentences. So if you translated these into Welsh, they would end in a mutation. Okay, so if any effects that we observe are simply due to familiarity with mutations, then we should expect a difference between brins and brins irrespective of the sentence context. But if what we're observing is syntactic transfer, then we shouldn't see a difference between brins and grins in no mutation context sentences, and we should see a difference between these two words in the mutation context sentences. Okay? So as I said, we were measuring ERPs, and the index we were in interested in was the phonological mismatch negativity, um, and so that's an ERP index of phonological expectancy. So, for example, if a participant was expecting brints and they um, were presented with grints, then you would expect a more negative PMN. Okay. So our results. These are the results for the no mutation context sentences. And essentially there's no difference between the mutated and um, the aberrant word. So no difference between grints and brints. Um, so our interpretation of this is that essentially neither grints nor brints were expected or anticipated within this context. 
Okay? But if you look at the mutation context sentences, we see a clear significant difference between these two words. Um, so here we have a more negative PMN amplitude for the aberrant word grince than for the mutated word brins. Um, and so our interpretation of this is that um, advertisements were anticipating a mutation, um, but they weren't anticipating an aberrant non-word. Okay, so that's why this is the same. Um, and yeah, so we're interpreting these results as strong evidence for syntactic transfer between languages. Um, and also, this effect occurred independently of whether or not there was an overlap between the English word and the Welsh word um, the Welsh translation in terms of initial consonant. And so because of this, um, we believe that this is rule-based rather than a lexically driven process. Okay, so study two. Now that we've kind of seen that syntactic transfer does occur, what are the underlying <coughs> mechanisms driving this transfer? Um, so again, to answer this, we looked to soft mutation, but we looked at a specific rule of soft mutation that incorporates both semantic and syntactic elements. Okay, so in Welsh, we have a gender-neutral pronoun A, which is his, her, or it, and A always triggers a mutation. Okay? So in the sentence, Wedi Andrew Ochlum and Covenant Hibur, Nia Shaydar Gamvod, A, Didalan. Okay? So the pronoun here triggers a mutation. But in order to determine the appropriateness of the mutation, the reader has to refer back to the antecedent. Okay? And in this case, because the antecedent is masculine, then a soft mutation should occur. Okay, so that's what, ha that's what happens in Welsh. <laughs> um, in English, it's a little bit easier because you have a pronoun, a gender-specific pronoun. Okay, so if you would think about mutations in English, um, the fact that you get the gender in the pronoun kind of eliminates the need to refer back to the context to determine the appropriateness of the mutation. So, if we apply this mutation rule to English sentences, would participants continue to use the semantic context of the semantic information even though it's not needed? Or would they adapt the transferred rule to rely solely on the unambiguous pronouns, so on the unambiguous syntactic triggers? Okay. Um, so, we had four experimental conditions. Um, so, we had sentences that had a masculine context, so Andrew, and a masculine trigger is. A uh, masculine context and a neutral trigger, so the neutral trigger is there. A uh, neutral context and a masculine trigger and both a neutral context and a neutral trigger. Okay, and all test sentences ended in a mutated non-word, so they're all ending in beige. So if participants continue to use the same processes as they would in Welsh, we would expect a main effect of context. Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit tricky. We would expect that non-words that were placed in neutral context sentences to elicit a more negative PMN amplitude than non-words placed in masculine context sentences. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, or, if they adapted the rule to rely on the syntactic trigger, then we would expect a main effect of trigger, with non-words, oh, sorry, mutated words preceded by neutral pronouns, so there, to elicit a more negative PMN amplitude than non-words um, preceded by masculine pronouns. Okay? Right. Um, so what did we find? We didn't find a PMN effect in this study, uh, surprisingly, so I'm not quite sure why that was. Um, but instead, we found this unexpected posterior P3 effect. Um, so this, was a, this um, is very much post hoc, so this wasn't um, hypothesized at all. But what we did find was a main effect of trigger here, with mutated words preceded by masculine triggers eliciting a more positive P3 effect than mutated words preceded by neutral triggers. Okay, so our interpretation of this, or one interpretation, is that participants were able to implicitly detect the appropriateness of the mutations when they were preceded by masculine triggers, uh, and thus attended to these stimuli more so than um, mutated words when they were presented when they were preceded by neutral pronouns. Okay. Um, so even though it was an unexpected <coughs> result, the fact that there's a main effect of trigger does seem to suggest that syntactic transfer occurred and also that the rule was adapted to incorporate elements of English. Okay, so study number three. Um, to what extent does syntactic transfer occur? 
So this study um, kind of came about after we had some criticisms about the previous studies. So obviously we used non-words in the other studies and people said that um, the inclusion of um, non-words might inadvertently activate the inactive language. So it's possible that when participants were reading the sentences they came across a non-word and this activated Welsh as a form of co conflict re resolution. So in order to kind of control for this or investigate this, we, in, um, we designed an eye tracking experiment in which the experimental manipulation occurred subliminally, so there was no explicit um, cue here. Okay, so the way we did this was by using the boundary paradigm in eye tracking. Um, so this is just a control sentence, so just to show you, so participants would just read this, being a royalist, he searched for the, so this line here is what I'll be referring to as a boundary. <coughs> so they're crossing the boundary, prince after reaching the kingdom. Okay, so that's just a normal sentence. But then we included sentences that had a mutated word as a paraphobial preview. Okay, so as they're reading um, here, we'll see that uh, in the paraphobia it says prince. So they'll be processing prince in the paraphobia. But then upon fixating on the word, it changes back to prince. So they're not explicitly um, reading prince. Okay. And then again, we have another condition where um, an aberrant non-word occurs in the paraphrase. So here we have grins, which changes to prince um, upon fixation. Okay, and again, uh, we had mutation context sentences and no mutation context sentences here. Um, I'm still collecting data on this, so I do have some preliminary data, but then that's by no means conclusive. Um, and I'm only going to show you one result. So I'm just going to show you the total dwell times on n minus 1. So this is the word that occurs directly before the boundary, yeah? so the the in the last um, example. Okay, um, and my interpretation now is just from eyeballing the, the data, so there's no stats to support this. Right? Um, but basically what it looks like um, is that brins is causing more processing difficulty here. So we have no mutation context sentences here, and a pr having a preview of prints and grins seems to be having the same effect, but having a preview of brins seems to be creating a processing problem. Um, so essentially, our interpretation is that when participants are not expecting a mutation and they are presented with a familiar mutation, then this causes a pr processing problem or a processing error um, reflected in total dwell time. Okay? And then if you look at the mutation context sentences, you kind of see an opposite pattern here. Um, so it seems like having um, a preview of brins and prints have the same effect, and in this case, it seems like having an aberrant preview causes the most difficulty. Okay, so our interpretation of this is that if participants are expecting a mutation and they get a mutated preview, then that is um, as helpful as having a base preview. But when they're expecting a mutation and they get an aberrant mutation, then this causes a processing problem reflected in um, total dwell time. Um, but as I said, that was just eyeballing the data. Uh, we did do some stats, so we conducted linear mixed effects on the data, and there was a significant interaction, um, and I think the reason, <laughs> my, well, <coughs> I'm sorry if I get this wrong now, um, but basically we think that that's being driven by the fact that the model expects the aberrant preview to be in the no mutation context to have a um, more, uh, higher dwell time. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah sorry. Okay. Um, but essentially, even though these are very preliminary data, they do suggest that some form of syntactic transfer ha is occurring in the data. Okay. So to conclude, um, my fin the findings of my PhD kind of suggest that syntactic rules do transfer across languages, and they do so in a rule-based manner rather than a lexically driven manner. Uh, syntactic transfer appears to be efficient based and adaptable based on the results of the second experiment and also syntactic transfer seems to occur in natural reading without the occurrence of an explicit cue. So thank you very much for listening.
of prints and one print. That was your syntactic manipulation yes. to put prints into the different syntactic context, right? Mm -hmm. But uh sounds like uh, oh. well. Yeah. So there's a chronological All right, yeah. context that you've established with that sound that would say you should mutate. It has nothing to do necessarily with syntax. Or, and that's just one example, but I don't know if that's... Did you always do one versus a? Uh? No, no. Obviously, yeah. No, it's not always one versus a. Uh, it's a whole load of um, of different ones for that exper for that yeah. experiment. Yeah, it yeah. was. Uh, so sometimes we'd have the, and then obviously depending on the grammatical gender of the noun, it would a mutation should or should not occur. So we had different types okay. of trigger. Yeah. Okay. So um. the from English would be uh in Welsh. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, no. Worth looking at this. Yeah, no, I haven't considered that, that yeah. before. Yeah. Because I, this goes to my understanding of why the mutations are in the first place, is that they're meant to smooth some of the right. articulatory b boundaries right between words. And that's sort of the idea. Of it. Yeah, I mean, um, as well, these sentences were presented, so they, they read the sentences, sure. they didn't okay. hear they them. Didn't hear them. But uh, yeah, it's definitely Sorry. something that could... Yeah, I hadn't thought of that after looking through it. Okay. I don't know if this helps with that, it doesn't help, but my, I have rudimentary understanding of Welsh after going to classes for a few years, and I know that some native speakers, I don't know if it's true for the examples you use, but they, they often don't correctly use mutations in certain contexts. And yeah. So you might know, you might be able to see in the data that the people, I don't know if that's because they do or don't know the rule, or if it's for some other reason, but you might see in the Welsh speakers, uh, Modulation of your effect based on the degree to which they correct the mutation, hmm. mutate or whatever the example. Yeah. So the data I presented were, were we did have a mutation task, so participants had to complete a task, and they were only included in <coughs> the sample if they were over a certain percentage. Um, oh, okay. So yeah. Then I've so we don't know. And we just we give more risk to the mill that it's really some rule thing. If you could say these guys. Welsh, but they don't understand the rule properly, and these guys speak Welsh and they do, and we see modulation in fact. Yeah, no, it, w it would be um, interesting to do, and I, I would do that, but I, did, I just didn't have enough um, people in the can't mutate group. Yeah, sure. so. Or won't. Oh, uh, yeah, or won't. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. It's it <coughs> a beautiful set of experiments. I really like Thank you. the design cycle of this. So, uh, so this is just a curiosity. How uh, did you pilot the stimuli before, like to, for expectancy to see oh, which so sentences were? As in close probability and things. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So all the experiments um, we did close probability tests with them, and um, for the first experiment, it was I think close probability point six. No. Yeah. Maybe a little bit high. I can't remember specifically. Um, so it, they weren't that high, but it was difficult to create the stimuli because of um, all the constraints with Welsh and everything. Um, but crucially, they didn't differ across conditions, so we controlled for that. So, um, yeah. Um, I, I was just wondering if you'd done any uh, any similar studies with non-Welsh speakers and the perception of their mutations, because I think didn't, wasn't Debbie also trying to do some work with perception of uh, Welsh mutations, but actually was getting some kind of odd results where even people who didn't speak Welsh were reacting uh, more in the expected Welsh way to yeah. these Welsh mutations. Yeah, so I haven't um, looked at non-Welsh speakers. Um, I know that Debbie did get some different results with that, but our experiments were quite different, so um, she was looking at um, mispronunciations, I think. Am I right, Eleanor? Yeah, um, um, but also I think the crucial difference is that um, Debbie's stimuli were independent of context, so they were just words. Whereas mine, it was the context that was uh, that we were most interested in. Yeah, so looking at how context affects mutation. Yeah. I have a question about the second experiment. So you said that difference could be due to more attention in that one condition, but wouldn't it be a more frontal thing to have it if it was more attention? Because it was so posterior, it suggests to me that it might be actually working memory updating and higher cognitive load, which is the opposite of the interpretation of, of it being more attended to. Uh, so anyway, just something to think about, really. What, what were your thoughts? Um, um, yeah. um, well, no, that, that's fine. I'd, I'd be happy for any alternative interpretations, because 
Um, to be honest, we weren't expecting a P3 effect at all. And if you know, if we were, then it would be more um, a more frontal um, effect that we were expecting. So that was just an attempt at interpreting the data. But if you have any ideas, I would I'd love to discuss them with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.